Okay, I, I would I would put it like this: the uprooting of the seven hundred thousand Arabs who became the Palestinian, the original Palestinian refugees, uh, who today, of course, include their their children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. They're all there's about five million altogether now, pal so-called Palestinian refugees. But of the original seven hundred thousand they left in a number of stages and the stages were marked by certain events uh, of the war itself. Um, the, the initial trigger to the departure of Arabs was the UN partition resolution where some Arabs found themselves in an area uh, earmarked for Jewish uh, sovereignty and they didn't want to be there and there was fighting along the seams between the communities, uh, between vi neighboring villages and in seams between urban neighborhoods in Haifa, Jerusalem, uh, Tel Aviv, Jaffa and so on. So people along the seam began to leave their homes because there was shooting there and as I say they also didn't want to live in, uh, Arabs didn't want to live in the Jewish state to be. Um, uh, I, I would say that the second most, second, and that led to the first wave of emigration or departure from homes and that consisted between December 47 and uh, the end of March 48 consisted of about 75,000 people but included much of the middle class. The middle, middle and upper class, it's the same class in Arab Palestine, had money, they wherewithal to leave the country and rent houses in Beirut or Nablus or somewhere else, they could leave easily hoping of course to come back. Um, um, uh, so the, the, the bulk of the middle class left in those four months but that was the bulk of the leadership class of the Palestinian people. So this undermined the, the going, the, 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 the confidence and staying power of the Arab masses. Come the second stage of the war, which began. Yeah, just to clarify, that was that was in the first few months after the, the, after months the UN after the UN resolution, which was the trigger of the war. The shooting began the day after the United Nations partition resolution. Arabs began to shoot in various parts of the country at Jews. That was the beginning of the war. The first shooting is the 30th of November, 47, the day after the UN partition resolution of the 29th of November, 47. Uh, the second stage, and, and this was the stage of mass emigration by Arabs or mass flight, began in April 1948 when the Jews decided to go over to the offensive and they began conquering parts of Arab Palestine, towns like Haifa, Arab Haifa and so on, and uh, clusters of villages along the Jerusalem Tel Aviv road. Uh, the Arabs began to flee because the Jews were conquering their territory and the Jews from that point on also began to be interested in departure of Arabs. Uh, so they made sure in some places that Arabs departed, though in most places Arabs simply fled because battle had reached their doorstep. So, so uh, can we characterize it, what, what, that, what that stage was like then in terms of actual the, the nitty-gritty the nitty well, of what was happening okay, on the ground? Okay, well I, in the months between the, sem, uh, the end of November 1947 and the end of March 1948, the Arabs were essentially on the offensive. They were the ones attacking Jewish convoys and settlements. When the Jews went over to the offensive in the beginning of April uh, 1948, they began to conquer clusters of Arab villages which threatened Jewish transport and convoys along the main roads, threatened Jewish presence in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Haifa and places north and uh, the etc. On block. So they began to conquer, the Jewish, the Jewish troops began to conquer a, a Arab villages along the roads. And then they decided in order to maintain conquest, it's better to destroy these villages. Of course, when you destroy the villages, it means the Arabs have nowhere to return to if they fled. Um, so, so that was the beginning of the uprooting of Arabs and it occurred in various areas in relation to Israeli offensives in various parts of the country, which occurred in April and the first half of May. 1948. Was there an event that, that triggered that shift in, in Yeshuv Jewish policy at the time? There wasn't really an issue, as I say, it wasn't even a matter of policy, it's the wrong word. There was an atmosphere of transfer. The Jews had withstood four months of Arab attacks, 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 and now they went over to the offensive. Yes. They went over to the offensive partly because they expected the Arab states who announced it uh, would threat, would invade the country. So they had to finish with the internal enemy, which was the Palestinians, before having to face outward the Arab armies about to invade them. And the Arabs, of course, did invade on the 15th of May, and the British left on the 14th of May. So they had to finish the job in those six weeks from the beginning of April until mid-May. They had to destroy the Arab militias. In doing that, the Arab militias were based in the villages as Jewish militias were based in Jewish villages. They had to conquer the villages. In conquering the villages, the Palestinians fled.
and when you say they conquered the villages, so it's, we're talking about the Haganah. Haganah, which is the, the is the IDF before it was called the IDF. It changed its name in June. Right. So to to what degree were there other militias uh, that, that that represented segments of Jewish society at the time that were operative? The okay. Process? There were three Jewish underground militias. There was a mainstream militia, which was the Haganah, which was about ninety percent of the country. That is represented ninety percent of the population. And there were two smaller, very small militias called the IZL and the LHI, which represented about 10% of the population. Their number, they had about 3,000 soldiers, all to, I'm not sure the word soldiers is right, 300 fighters altogether. The Haganah had 30,000 fighters. That was the propor relative proportions. Um, the Haganah did most of the conquering and most of the warfare. The IZL and LHI, the two dissident, as they were called, militias, representing the right, uh, which was very small at the time. Today they rule Israel, but at the time they were very small in the Israeli, um, in, in the Israeli population. Um, they had an important impact on the departure of Arabs uh, because they conquered a village together on the 9th of April 1948 called Dir Yassin, just outside of Jerusalem. And in that village, while conquering it, they killed civilians, and, and it was subsequently called a massacre. They killed about 100 civilians there. Uh, in the two in the village during that day of fighting and immediately afterwards. And this was at an early stage in the war? On the 9th of April. So it's the beginning of that second stage where there's the mass Arab flight. The, the massacre was highlighted in, America, in British and Arab broadcasts, radio broadcasts, public announcements and so on. Mm -hmm. And this publication of these atrocities caused great, a great deal of despondency among Arabs in Palestine in general and led to their flight from various places. So what that meant was that Dir Yassin was a major uh, ca catalyst to Arab flight throughout the country and helped precipitate that large flight of about two to three hundred thousand which occurred in uh, April, May, June 1948 and which was the second stage of the Arab departure. And, and that flight was from all areas of the country? or was it... it occurred in various areas, usually linked to Jewish offensives in those areas. You've got the Jerusalem Tel Aviv Road and the villages along it. You've got the Jewish conquest of Arab Haifa uh, on the 21st, 22nd of April. You've got the Jewish conquest of Arab Tiberias on the 18th of April. You've got a Jewish attack on Arab Jaffa on the 25th, 27th of April, and from in each of these attacks, Arabs flee, partly also because they had heard about what had happened in Dir Yassin, uh, Jewish atrocities, Arab flight. And, and there was, so there was little to, to no coordination between the Haganah and, and these other two paramilitary groups with respect to what to do once these areas have been conquered or in the process of conquering them? No, no, the question wasn't about that. The question was basically about where the, the IZL and uh, LHI should operate. The army really was the Haganah. These little dissident groups, which were seen as a sort of anno an annoyance by the Haganah general staff, Haganah wanted them to do something in the Jerusalem area, and they said, no, we want to conquer Dir Yassin. So the Haganah says to them, okay, go ahead, conquer Dir Yassin, but make sure that you uh, stay in place. You leave, stay in the, in the village once you've conquered it, garrison it, uh, which they didn't do. The Haganah had to move in afterwards. Um, about Jaffa, there was no real coordination. Uh, um, on the 25th of April, of, of April the IZL attacked Arab Jaffa. Uh, ben Gurion, basically, who headed the Haganah politically, said we should leave Jaffa. Jaffa is going to fall anyhow. There's no point in fighting over Jaffa. But the LHI, or especially the IZL, were interested in uh, getting political capital out of conquering something, achieving their own uh, military success. So they went ahead and attacked Jaffa. In the, on the 25th of April. And that also had an effect on Arab um, immigration because Jaffa was the largest of the Arab towns in Palestine at the time. Larger than Haifa even? Yes, much larger. Well, not much larger, but larger. Haifa had about 70,000 Arabs, Jaffa probably had 80,000. Did that early attack on Jaffa precipitate a large flight of Arabs from Jaffa? Yeah, well, Arab flight from Jaffa had begun before. Without doubt, the, the attack on Jaffa precipitated further flight. Though the, the, the attack on Jaffa was stymied by the British who, uh, who um, um, sent in troops because they didn't want the Israelis to conquer Jaffa. There was a whole uh, imbroglio there, but, 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 but uh, in the end the attack itself led, precipitated a mass flight from Jaffa, yes.
Right. So, so what do you say to the argument that I've, that I've heard in some circles that these other two um, paramilitaries or militias were essentially serving as a, a degree of plausible deniability with respect to the Zionist leadership in the sense that, like, like, you see, like you've seen throughout history in, in many other places, even in, you know, in the 20th century, for instance, in, um, in Indonesia during the fight of the nationalists versus the communists, they essentially outsourced mass killings of communists no, I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think it's comparable to what happened in Indonesia. I think that Ben-Gurion did understand who headed the government and headed the Haganah, later the IDF, as defense minister. He understood the uses uh, of the IZL and the LHI, but more, I think basically they were annoyance and a problem for him, which is why he went ahead and crushed them. Uh, he destroyed the IZL in June 1948 and he crushed the LHI in September 1948 after they killed Bernadotte. So, uh, one, one could argue though that, that that's convenient timing. Yeah, it could, no, no, I'm not, not disputing that. I'm saying they were his political enemies. He didn't like them. He didn't trust them. They were doing things without discipline. They weren't being, weren't controllable. This really annoyed him. Uh, but on the other hand, you're probably right that at certain stages in the evolution of the conflict, certainly in the 30, late 30s, um, uh, he understood that they served a useful purpose also. The Haganah didn't have to do some dirty work, but they did it. But, but th th this isn't to say that he in any way uh, hoped for or precipitated the Dir Yassin massacre, massacre, for example. The Haganah opposed them going into Dir Yassin and then sort of bowed, acquiesced in them doing it, not the massacre, but in conquering that particular village. Um, so it wasn't coordinated. Essentially, I think he saw them as a disturbance to the national will and national campaigns. Um, but, but, but probably at some, somewhere in his mind, he also said there probably is something useful about these guys. Uh, for example, the killing of Bernadotte would certainly not have been sanctioned by Ben-Gurion and the, the higher echelons of government. But the, the guy was a, an impediment to Jewish sovereignty and he had all sorts of plans for redividing the country and taking away some of the gains of the IDF during the war. So if he was killed, you know, okay, it's an embarrassment. We'll crush the LHI, but we'll also benefit from his disappearance from the scene. Right. And do we have, do we have any, any documentation or, or has, is there any oral history record with respect to what the intent or the thinking process was of Izzet el Lech during the Dar Yassin, everything that transpired there essentially? Uh, the IZL and the LHI were not very, I mean, they were tightly knit organizations, but they didn't produce paperwork like the Haganah did, which was like an army and everybody there was busy writing reports and orders. The IZL and LHI were underground organizations. Some called them terrorists. Uh, they weren't leaving a, a lot of documentation around. So we don't really know what they intended beyond the fact that they wanted to conquer Dir Yassin and expel its population. Uh, in fact, there we was do, some, we there was some yes, we, we know, we, yes, we know they wanted to expel, but we don't, there is no evidence at all that they intended slaughter and appe appears to have happened, that is the killings of people in the village appears to have been quite spontaneous. They encountered a lot of a, 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 um, Arab fire and they, they suffered casualties. About 25 of the fighters were killed or injured in the attack on Dir Yassin, which was about a, about a, one sixth of the attacking force, which is large casualties. So they, they were really angry with the population and some of them went ahead and killed people. Uh, that's what happened there. It wasn't an, an intended um, um, a massacre, if that's the right word for what happened, because they weren't people weren't lined, uh, you know, lined up along a wall and shot. That's not how they killed some people here. They killed some people there. It, it was a very haphazard the whole thing. Um, but, but they did understand the benefit of it because afterwards we know that Be Be Begin, uh, the commander of the IZL, uh, later Israel's prime minister, when he writes his famous book, The Revolt, his memoir of what happened, he does write, uh, this was of great benefit to the IDF, what happened in Dir Yassin, because it caused Arab flight around the country. Right. So, But this wasn't the intention, this was the product. Oh, the the uh, consequence of what happened. Right. It, it would it be equally or more accurate to say that we have no documentation insinuating that there was intent. Intent to massacre, no documentation at all. It's, it's, it's absence no, of no, evidence. No, 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 no. Look, we know the idea, the IZL conquered other places and didn't commit massacre. So uh, there's no reason to suppose that that was the intention in Dir Yassin. 
no reason at all. Right. And we know from the, the, the circumstances of what happened in that place, it was more or less spontaneous what happened. Some people killed some people, some people didn't kill people. Uh, and there was a, sm a small, uh, very small uh, bloodbath, uh, essentially. It's not, you know, 100 dead in a, a, a war like that. Uh, uh, you know, you talk about Srebrenica and uh, 19, whatever it is, in, you know, 9,000 dead in a couple of days and all intended. And uh, there's no comparison. This is a massacre which occurs during wartime by hot-headed troops who've suffered casualties. And in, t in terms of documenting and, and, and understanding the history of that event, is it, it, um, what, what sources do historians use to try to reconstruct it? Well, you have the, the sources on Deir Yassin, you don't have almost any uh, IZL, LHI sources. There's no contemporary Arab sources. The villagers were all basically illiterate. They didn't leave sources. Um, you've got um, British documentation, the British investigated what had happened, and you've got a Haganah intelligence documentation of what happened, which also alleged that there were atrocities there, uh, comparable to a massacre in general. Um, um, uh, so you've got good documentation from a day two or two or three after, from the British and from the Haganah, about what happened. And what about oral histories from, from Palestinians or fighters themselves? You can trust them or not trust them. Both the Israeli fighters and the Haganah and the Arab uh, villagers, and some of them, I some of them I assume, I've heard Arab villagers oral testimony delivered 40 years after the event, and some of the what they say sounds absurd and exaggerated. Some of the fighters, uh, 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 um, when recalling what happened, also give it a sort of a, a soft spin. Um, you know, we didn't intend anything and it just happened and, and uh, we didn't really kill civilians, you know, all sorts of stories. Uh, so I, I don't trust people's oral testimony 30 or 40 years after the event in the midst of an ongoing conflict. So they have political interests in selling different, uh, you know, narratives. Uh, trust documentation. Though, uh, let me say one other thing to add to that. But it is true that the traditional story which emerged from Deir Yassin, both from IZL a Haganah and Arab sources immediately after was that about 250 villagers were killed. And it was an Arab professor from Birzeit University who worked out family by family who had actually been killed there. He did this work in the 1970s and discovered that altogether the number of dead there of uh, innocent villagers and combatants, Arab combatants, was 110. So uh, uh, that sort of revisionism is acceptable if it's done scientifically. It's not based on oral testimony, it's simply done in, in terms of family body counts. And it, is, is there not an argument to be made for at least triangulating with oral history, so to speak? Like if you have, let's say if you have, you know, if you have 20 oral histories taken and, and two of them claim, you know, outlandish numbers, but, but the rest seem to have fairly consistent stories. Does that not point to some sort not of historical? No, no, not necessarily. People, people's oral history, what happens in oral history is that people have an individual memory, initially an individual memory of, of an event or a battle, eh, and then they meet their brothers, they meet their sisters, they meet fellow villagers, they meet fellow combatants from their unit, and they, you know, they meet over bonfires a year later or five years later, and they start discussing what had happened, and they eventually produce a collective memory of what happened, which may not be true. They eventually all agree. From the, you find this among Israeli soldiers, and you find this among Palestinians. They all seem to sound the same 40 years later. They don't have individual memories. They have a collective memory, which they each say is their individual memory. And it's not necessarily true. So I wouldn't trust them at all, no. It, it, could, could the same be said for, for people's memory of the Holocaust? It can't, because in the Holocaust, a, a, eyewitness testimony was already taken within months of the end of the Holocaust from individual people. In other words, there wasn't the ability for a villager, you know, villagers from one village to start espousing and then putting together a collective memory. Everybody, people were, you know, individually questioned immediately after the event or almost immediately of the very few survivors of certain places. And there's so much testimony and it all corresponds. And of course, you've got German documents and, and British and American troops were there who saw what had happened. So, so it all comes together and basically backs each other are up, the, the, the evidence, the German, the Jewish, the, the Western, the Russian, it all, it all uh, um, 
uh, emerges with the same narrative. Certainly, there's, I mean, there's, there's a, a... No, but I'm saying the testimony, the high testimony, uh, is from almost immediately after the event, or the years or months after the, the events occur. Whereas here we're talking about really what people are talking about 40 years later. Right. So as an historian, what, what concerns you is the degree of time and... It's time and proximity so to the events, yeah, and, and the, the, the collectivization of memory. So, so on that note then, my, my understanding is, or, or if we go back to the chronology for a second, so around this time, um, after, after April of 48, the, the uh, Jewish forces are, are sort of rolling upwards uh, along the coast and out into, into more outlying areas, conquering these regions in anticipation of Arab armies. Yeah, I would say, I wouldn't say rolling up the coast, I would say they were taking certain Arab Set con concentrations, Jaffa, Haifa, they, it wasn't rolling, it was, the battlefield wasn't a, with fronts, it was in each town, in each cluster of villages, there were Jewish villages, Arab villages along each road, but it's true that towards the fronts, eastwards basically, and southwards, there was an effort to fortify the front lines basically of the Jewish state as earmarked by the UN partition resolution. Right, and, uh, and what about, so I'm, think, I'm thinking specifically now with respect to the north, so there's, uh, I'm curious what happened specifically in Haifa and the Galil, but also there's this very contentious event in uh, a town called Tantura. Which I don't think it's that contentious, but okay. The Jewish shift to the offensive began in early April, and Tantura occurs uh, seven or eight days after the Pan-Arab invasion, in other words, on the 23rd of May. So uh, it's, okay. it's not early on, it's so, later on. So um, time, yeah. yeah, and, and um, uh, the Alexandrani Brigade conquers Tantura. Um, the, it suffers one, uh, 10 or 12 dead there. And the Tantura people, according to the Israeli uh, official historiography, they, they suffer about 70 dead in the conquest of the village. And then the villagers are expelled. That's what happens, about 500 or 1,000 or whatever the number is of villagers are expelled. Uh, some years ago, uh, an Israeli student, MA student, wrote a thesis in which he claimed that many of the, uh, some of the, uh, survi the, the survivors or refugees from Tantura had claimed that the, uh, on the 23rd of May there had been a, a massacre of 200 to 250, a systematic massacre by Alexandroni troops of young villagers, ma males. Um, uh, this was disputed by the Alexandr Alexandroni Brigade veterans who had conquered the place. They said there, were no, there was no massacre, no mass killing of people, though some of them admitted here and there there was some people, were some people who were individually shot or a, cl a cluster of people were shot, but, but this, well, there wasn't a general massacre as Teddy Katz and people like Ilan Pape, who supported him, had claimed. L let, me, let me say one other sure. thing. Yeah. There is no document from 1948 which says that there had been a massacre in Tantura. No document. Right. No Israeli document, no United Nations document, no known Arab document, no Western document. And this is at variance with every massacre which I encountered and I discovered a whole batch of massacres and wrote about them in my book, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. Every one of the other massacres has a piece of written evidence or at least reference to it. Dir Yassin, Jish, all of them have reference to massacres either by Israeli observers or Israeli troops, United Nations observers, British diplomats, American diplomats. Somebody refers to a massacre having occurred or even describes the massacre in some way wrongly or rightly. Here there's not one piece of evidence from 48 saying there was a massacre there. Right, so there's not one piece of written evidence. So, so um, Katz's thesis and those that have argued in favor of his original findings are relying entirely on oral history, essentially, yes. And, and, yes. and that's why, as an historian... It's problematic. It's very problematic. I wouldn't say there was no massacre. Flatly, there was no large massacre there. I would say the evidence shows nothing to do with any massacre. There is no evidence of massacre. In fact, there's one document which I... And when you, say, when you say evidence as an historian of documents... documents. Well, I'm an historian. Historians rely on documents. Those who rely on oral testimony if that's their basis for reconstructing the past, it's not serious, in my view. That's my view. But there is a piece of one piece of evidence which I think is crucial in this respect, which strongly points to the fact that there was no massacre there. And that is that the Haganah, 
intelligence service listened to transmissions from Arab, the Arab radio broadcasts. And the Arab radio broadcasts were eager to say there were Jewish atrocities. Um, and one of the broadcasts monitored by the Haganah and written in its daily or weekly reports of Arab radio broadcasts says a number of women from Tantura who had reached Iraqi lines in the West Bank, had reached, uh, the Iraqis had conquered the northern West Bank. They reached Iraqi lines in, in, uh, in, in the West Bank and told their, the Iraqi officers that there had been rapes in Tantura and a lot of uh, looting in Tantura, and no, none of them, the, the broadcast, monitor, the monitored broadcast, nobody mentions any massacre. In other words, they complain about the Israelis, they committed a couple of rapes, and they had looted all our property and maybe destroyed houses. They all, you know, they're charging Israel with things, these uh, uh, survivors, if you like, of Tantura, but they don't mention a massacre, which is, it doesn't make any sense. Either the Israeli monitors were uh, omitting something the women had told uh, uh, th these officers, and this was broadcast on the Arab radio um, uh, fully with a massacre, but nobody re registered it, or um, they simply didn't tell their people in the West Bank that there had been a massacre, and that's what seems likely, because there's no reason for the Israelis in internal correspondence to have omitted the full charges by the Arab women who were, were complaining about Israeli behavior. There's no reason for, because in other places they do mention, you know, the reports from the Arab side say the women or whoever it is complained there had been a massacre. Here, there's, it's not mentioned. So there's a, so there's it a seems conspicuous to be a total, absence. It seems to be an invention, yes. The whole thing seems to be an invention. Which, which By Arab, survive, Arab uh, refugees from Tantura, goaded or whatever by political, for political interests. So, so, so in your opinion, it may not even be a case of simply um, uh, a, a post facto collective memory forming sort of organically, but even something more... Yeah, I would say it's, it's politi a politically motivated allegation uh, with no basis in, any docu in, doc in fact or in documentation. That's what I would say. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so th th that's, that's very different from what, you, from what one reads amongst, the, um, um, amongst those who argue in favor of the existence of the massacre, of I'm course, not right? Responsible. So yes, exactly. Yeah, no, it, it's it's very interesting, and this is this it gets into the nitty gritty of the of the controversy of history and what one regards as legitimate or uh, look, illegitimate I, I, I material. Also, I also interviewed uh, uh, people because I, I actually checked the business of Tantura many year, years later after I wrote about this, the other subjects. Tantura never came up in this respect. I interviewed uh, Alexandroni veterans from Tantura, and I even interviewed a couple of Arabs who lived inside Israel, uh, but were free to speak their minds, and Israel Arabs can say what they like. Um, um, and the Alexandroni veterans to a man said there had been no massacre, and this was all completely false, though here and there there were some people who shot wounded people and so on, which is the sort of thing which occurs in wars always. Um, and the Arabs I talked to who lived in Foredis, which is a village not far from where, where Tantura used to be, um, they said, one of the, the, the guy I interviewed said, I was there accompanied by an Israeli soldier walking in the alleyways of Tantura and I saw Israeli soldiers shoot a batch of Arabs, like 10, 20, whatever the number was, in a certain alley at a certain point in time on the 23rd of, of May, but there was no systematic massacre, as this guy alleges. I never heard about it, I never saw it. And that in other words, he's saying there was an atrocity, but it wasn't this systematic atrocity which uh, Teddy Katz and Ilan Pape uh, um, allege. Interesting. So, there, so according to this particular eyewitness account, there was mass killing, but, but well, not... Well, uh, the word mass killing is a bit strong. There was a shooting of a cluster of Arabs in a certain place in an alleyway. What Teddy Katz described, and Ilan Pape in, in endorses, is that the Israelis took batches of young men from the uh, population of Tantura who were clustered in the, uh, assembled in, on the sh shore at Tantura, took them to the village cemetery, got them to dug mass graves, shot them, took another batch, got them to dug mass, dig mass graves, shot them up to a number of 200, 250 people. That's the allegation. A systematic Nazi-like slaughter of people, of young men. And what this guy is describing is an atrocity in a certain place inside the village, not in the cemetery, which has nothing to do with Teddy Catch's allegations. And I assume there's, there's no physical evidence then of that. 
of of these supposed mass graves, or they or nobody's found them, and I doubt whether the kibbutz on which uh, which was founded on the land of Tantura would agree to a mass circus of journalists showing up, digging up gra uh, Even if they find bodies, they'll nobody will know how exactly they died because there were everybody says there were dozens of people killed in the battle for Tantura. So there must be a mass grave somewhere of at least seventy who died there, not to do with any uh, massacre, but just a battle. Um, uh, so if they find bodies, people will say these are people from the bat, you know, from the battle, um, um, uh, not from. Uh, and it's a circus, and there'll never be a resolution of the thing. No, nobody's going to dig up a whole kibbutz just to f see if there are mass graves there. <laughs> right. And no kibbutznik is going to agree to that. Yes, interesting, <laughs> very interesting. Which 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 means that it's it's relegated to these debates over. The validity of oral versus lack of, of written testimony, essentially. Well, it's not just a matter, you know, but it's not as simple as that, because you do have on the Jewish side oral testimony also, which co co contradicts completely what the Arab oral testimony is. So it's not oral versus documentation or lack of documentation. It's oral versus it's, it's oral, oral exactly, versus documentation. Exactly, exactly. Right. Which is why one should rely on documents, because in, or, in an oral contest, there'll always be this sort of argument which is un, uh, uh, insoluble or unreconcilable. Right. So then it's only when in oral testimony you have from one side, your own side, alleging that your people committed a massacre that you might be able to believe in it. But if it's people from the other side alleging it, uh, you know, it's as good as your denial, as your side's denying it in oral testimony. Just because of, of human psychology, you're saying? Psychology, the politics of the, 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 the propaganda wars between the sides and so on, yeah. Right. So, so from a perspective of documentation, how would you characterize what happened in, in these areas approaching, approaching the borders where the Jewish forces were anticipating Arab armies to invade? What, what does the documentation show actually occurred with respect to the expulsion of the Palestinians? And the Most people the fled. Most people fled in face of the encroaching or approaching or feared Jewish armies uh, at, on their doorstep. That's what people did. They just fled. In most places, here and there, like in Dawaima, in uh, the end of October 1948, there was also a massacre. In other words, people flee, but they catch some people and shoot them in a cave. That you see. But but in most places, most being 90% of the cases, people just flee in face of encroaching battle, and they also fear atrocities because atrocities have been broadcast. So they fear this is going to happen to my daughters and my children. Right. So so for, for instance, let's just take the the case of Haifa. So th this one's this one also seems quite confounded because you have essentially some, some wings of the Jewish, uh, of the proto-Jewish state, the nation Jewish state, uh, arguing, arguing that the Arabs should stay, um, and, and, and then and others saying that the, that the, the Arab leadership themselves were, were calling on the Arabs no, to no, flee, yeah. but then there was also a shelling of the Arab population in okay. Haifa. So how, is, do, how, does one, how does one make war, sense of war this? War is confusing, and lots of different things happen in war. That's right, but as an historian, so, this is precisely no, your bread and butter, right? Some, there are important pieces of evidence which helps us to build the picture of what happened hour by hour in a place like Haifa on the 21st, 22nd of April 1948. And what happened is you've got a battle between the Jewish militia, the Haganah, and the Arab militias, which the Haganah eventually wins, which, which leads to mass flight of people from the downtown Arab areas into the port area. There's shelling by the Haganah of the downtown areas, which is part of the battle against the militias, but can also be interpreted as something which precipitates flight of civilians. It contributes to the civilian flight. Um, you've got a Jewish mayor uh, of Haifa who asks the Arabs to stay put, unlike in most places, incidentally. He's, he's, it's very unusual. A, a Jewish mayor asks the Arabs, don't leave, please stay. And you've got the Arab local leadership telling their people to leave. We, we have no choice, we can't stay because, well, they don't explain it that way, but because it will mean that the Arab states will interpret us as accepting Jewish rule if we stay. And that will be treason. So they don't say that, but that's what they mean. Uh, so they tell their people to leave. There's hard evidence of that. And they leave. The Arab majority of the town leaves. The 70,000 Arabs in the town originally, there's about 3,000 left at the end of the 1948 war. So most of them listen either to the voice of the mortars at hitting them or to their leader. The which, which you're saying were actually aimed, let's say, at specifically or at least nominally at the militias no, in no, their I, midst? I would say it's a bit more blurred than that. They were aiming to devastate Arab morale.
which would lead to the, 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 the collapse of the militia resistance. It means attacking the militias, but yet it's not that accurate mortars, at least the way they were used in 48. So basically you're shelling the downtown area. And in shelling the downtown area, you're going to collapse militia morale, but you're also going to collapse local civilian morale, which will lead to flight. Which, which was at odds, it seems, at least on the face of it, with what the mayor himself was well, calling Well, the mayor it. said it at the end of the battle, not during the fighting. The fighting is altogether about 20 hours. The mayor in the meeting in the town hall, Shabtai Levi, the mayor says to the Arab leaders, after they say, we want to leave and we're going to tell our people to leave, he says to them, don't leave, stay. We've lived here for generations in peace. Why lead to refugeedom for your people? And that was after the shelling. It's at the end of the battle, after the battle. There's a meeting of the local leaderships with the British commanders and the Haganah commanders and the local Arabs who've remained the leaders, and they all sit and decide what to do. And the Arabs announce we're leaving, the Arab leaders. We're going to tell our people to leave. And the mayor says to them, no, no, please stay. And, and the British commander also seems to say, why should you leave? The Jews are willing to accept you here. And uh, the Haganah commander is silent there at that meeting. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't say, please stay or please leave. He just watches the Haganah representative in the meeting. Um, but the Arab leaders tell their people to leave and that's what happens. And, and in what sense is that, is that sort of complex combination of factors analogous to what happens in other parts of the north and also and then no, it's, it's not an, an, uh, there's no analogy for this because it's the only place where we have hard evidence that the Arab leaders tell their people to leave. We do, uh, on the other, it's analogous in the sense that there's Jewish attack on a certain neighborhood or village and there's mortaring in the village or the neighborhood and this causes people to flee. That's analogous to hap happenings around the place. But there's also very few places where a Jewish leader steps up and says, please stay. This is very unusual also. Much like, as I say, you've got evidence of Arabs standing up and saying, please leave. This, the, neither of these are common um, events in the, the 48 war. You had mentioned that the, the, the pattern of, of where Arab civilians ended up remaining in, in 48 Israel seems to be tied either directly or partially to the individual intentions of generals and other militia leaders. So for instance, in the north, you end up having a much larger resident Arab population than you do in the, Jerusalem, the Tel Aviv-Jerusalem uh, corridor and the south. So what how would, you, how would you characterize the difference in, in the mentalities of the, of the generals and the, and, the, and the particular events that occurred in those, in those different okay, look, areas? Look, there are hardline generals and there are softer generals. And the hardline generals, some of them coming from the Achdut Avodah, part of Mapam, like Igal Alon, commander of Southern Front at the end of the war, a commander of the Lida Ramle operation in the middle of the war, um, they didn't want Arabs to stay behind. They saw them as a threatened threat, as a fifth column potentially. Uh, these are the enemies and we don't want them to be here, uh, Arab populations in general. And you've got other commanders uh, who are um, softer, if you like, on Arabs, aren't um, as yeah, aren't as hardline, if you like, like Moshe Carmel in the north, also in Haifa, where Arabs do remain, even though most of them flee. He doesn't make sure that they don't remain there. The same happens in Acre, incidentally, under Moshe Carmel, Arabs remain in Acre. And the same happens throughout the Galilee later when he conquers it. Uh, he doesn't insist on uh, departure, and he lets basically his majors do what they like. You know, some majors and captains expel people from villages, Some, most of them simply uh, allow what happens to happen. And uh, most of the villagers flee, but in the Galilee, most don't flee and you end up with a large Arab population there. There's no policy. That's right. the problem. Uh, yeah. So just on the no policy points, I, I, I read, I think in, in one of your own books, this, this, um, this either document or concept of plan dalet. So just, 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 uh, just while it's still in, in my memory, can you, okay. can you explain to me what that means? In March 1948, um, after four months, essentially, of the Arabs attacking the Jews in Palestine, Arabs of Palestine attacking Jews in Palestine, uh, the Haganah has to confront the reality of what is happening in Palestine, that is, uh, Jewish vulnerability, and the imminence of British uh, departure, which is going to be on the 14th of May, and pan-Arab attack, Arab armies, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, attacking uh, the new state of Israel when it emerges in the middle of May. 
Um, so they have to plan for that. And the Haganah general staff draws up a plan with respect to what is going to happen in May. And they essentially say that plan should be put into operation in the, la in the second week of May, just before uh, the British depart and just before the Arab armies are expected to invade the country. Uh, and the plan says we should secure the main roads between our concentrations of population, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, uh, Haifa, etc. And we should secure the border areas so that the Arab armies, when they try to invade, will find it hard to get into the country properly. Um, and clearing these areas in some places will necessitate a, a Arab departure or, or expelling Arabs. And this is essentially left up to the individual commanders to determine who to expel and who not. It essentially says Arabs who are busy attacking you, you should expel the, the villagers who do this. And Arabs who are quiescent or uh, willing to coexist, you should garrison the villages and leave them in place. That's essentially what it says. Urban neighborhoods which are problematic, like in Haifa, he says move the population into the interior of the town. In other words, from Wadi Rushmia, move them into Khalisa, or from Khalisa, move them into Wadi Nisnas, or whatever in Haifa. Uh, not expel them. It doesn't talk about expelling it. It, it uh, says to move them or transfer them from outlying districts where they control certain roads into and out of town to move them into the center of the Arab uh, concentration in the town. Uh, but it doesn't, there's no order in the thing to expel Arabs, the Arabs in general, as historians who are pro-Arab have been contending for a long time that this is the plan of expulsion. It's not. It's nonsense. The preamble of the plan actually says what it is. It is to secure the Jewish state in the event of British departure, or when that happens, uh, and uh, uh, in the event of the Arab, pan-Arab onslaught on the Jewish state. Secure border areas, secure the main roads. That, that's what it basically is about. And a small section of it sort of empowers the regional commanders to determine the fate of the villages in their area in relation to their friendliness or unfriendliness. So it's not, in your estimation, then, a grand plan for the... Nonsense. Only anti-Zionist historians who are willing to distort what documents are saying, um, does it appear so. Excellent. Okay, that's a great point I wish to add. Thank you. It adds a lot of clarity. Okay, I really good. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good.